Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you're watching and listening to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Today, my very special guest is Kim Russell. Kim Russell has lived in and around several UFO hotspots in California, such as Ridgecrest and Tehachapi, and currently lives and works in Las Vegas, Nevada. She has had many encounters with interdimensional beings to include blue light beings, orange aliens, grays, and tall grays. Kim is also a remote viewer and healer, is psychic and telepathic, and is also able to travel in and out of various realms and dimensions. She also has past life memories and experiences that continue to bleed, bleed through into this reality. Kim also remembers being sent down here into this hologram as part of a mission, in part to do earth magic in order to create a earth. More recently, Kim is involved in the paranormal community as a part-time investigator and researcher, as well as a radio personality and host of the new Tunnel Talk podcast, of which I was a recent guest. Thank you. Kim has had numerous interactions with such beings, ghosts, and demons, as well as real-life vampires. She is enjoying filming and producing videos and is currently working on a documentary regarding her experiences in Goldfield, Nevada, a very haunted town just outside of Area 51. Uh, Kim's website is vegasincparanormal.wordpress.com, and we'll have all of her contact and website information on our website and dedicated YouTube channel. So without any further ado, uh, Kim Russell, an old friend of mine, welcome to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Thank you, James. Thank you so much. Well, tell, I've been looking forward to this discussion because it, to me, I think of these things as like two old friends sitting by a campfire, just catching up. Tell our listeners uh, about yourself, about, about your upbringing, about your, your childhood and, and the formative experiences that you know led you to this awakening that, oh, wow, we live in a much wider realm. Um, a lot more things go on here than is uh, commonly understood. Well, um, so I went over some of my memories and I was taking notes yesterday and I really sat down and, and I have journals upon journals and I just pretty much write the dates and times of all my experiences. Um, of course, I didn't write any of the childhood ones down, but I started reflecting back. And one of the first memories that I have of, of being a, about three or four years old um i believe angels or something would would talk to me and um play with me and um, and then um i apparently i started listening or playing with something else or or something else but at a very young age i i realized i had some some pretty magical abilities uh i remember as a little girl possibly around the age of four sitting in the bathtub and uh, doing magic, you know? I would, I had a little cup and I had water and I would um, say things to the cup and the water and leave it there overnight and go back and do it again and do it again and these things, and then things would happen, you know? Uh, one time I did something that scared the living daylights out of me, so I, I stopped. And that's pretty much where I kind of closed it off and, um, you know, I was just too afraid to mess around like that anymore. Um, and then moving on, I remember moving to Vegas. I was in first grade and um, I had my own room and I would go to bed at night and my mom would turn off the light, kiss me goodnight. And then I would open my eyes and I would see those, uh, those shadow uh, spiders. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard of them, but they were big, like, big shadow spiders. So um, on the folds of my blanket, I would see them peep up and then they would just start slowly walking towards me and another one would peep up and another till next thing you know, they were pretty much all over my bed or wherever and I would scream bloody murder. Um, so my mom would come run in, she would turn on the light, nothing there, she'd, she'd turn off the light and they'd, they'd slowly creep up out of the bed and just start walking towards me. And that went on for a long time till I, again, I learned to just shut my eyes, uh, scared to death, I'll, you know, just hide under the blanket every night when I went to bed. Eventually, you know, I learned to be afraid. Um, and then growing up um, and moving around to other houses, 
I would hear footsteps and things like that. And then I would look up into the windows and I would see those, um, those shadow men, you know, they kind of had like those big friar hats. And I always remember looking them, looking in on me, scared to death again, you know, um, but I would hear them walking around and, and, and so you talk about a little girl that grew up just afraid of the dark and, um, and then, uh, moving on, you know, nobody would believe me. And I would ask people, Hey, did you hear? Nope. Didn't hear, you know, so maybe I thought it was my imagination. Um, moving on after that, um, uh, in high school, it just seemed like we're, there was always haunted houses and always just things, you know, appearing and, and making noise and things. Um, so, so then let's see, Moving on, because I know I'm leaving out stuff, but um, um, my mom, she had some pretty amazing abilities. Uh, she could actually conjure up um, like holograms. And um, so, you know, I always thought that me and my mom were kind of special. My, grand my grandfather always told me, you and your mom are like encyclopedias, you know, you just don't know how to use it. And I, I never understood what he was talking about. Um, and then I've had experiences where, where I've called upon angels because I was in a situation and, um, I was in a situation where I, you know, I was living with my boyfriend and he, um, he would get drunk and then he would swing at me and things like that. And I would just say, just go to sleep, leave me alone. And so this one night I, w I was praying, please, Lord, send me a thousand angels to make him go to sleep and to stop. I just kept saying it over and over. And then something landed on the roof and you could hear the footsteps just walking towards the bedroom part and then very slowly and, and very hard. And all of a sudden the door flew open and my boyfriend said, oh, my God, look, 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 there's something in the doorway. I was too scared again to look and I just, you know, hid. And within a matter of seconds, he was out like a light. And then the dog in the house was actually barking at the door and then would, um, I don't know if you could hear the footsteps starting to walk away on the house. You, the dog actually ran to the living room, was barking at something in the living room. So um, moving on to the alien aspect. So we were living in needles for a while and then we moved to Ridgecrest and I was in high school. So um, now I don't really remember too many experiences there. Okay. But I would go to Tehachapi to visit my boyfriend who would stay in there. And every night I would wake up with bloody noses. I mean, severe bloody noses. You know, I'm like, what, what's going on? It was embarrassing. It got to be so embarrassing to where I, I didn't want to go there anymore. I just went back to Ridgecrest. But nothing really weird would happen there. Um, you, I eventually moved to Tehachapi, and my friends they would go hiking, and they would say they would see UFOs flying over. Um, apparently, there was some underground bases there in Sand Canyon, um, and one of my friends was able to sneak through and crawl into a um, an air shaft, an air vent, and crawl down in there and actually see the aliens working with the people there. And so that's when I had one of my major experiences was in Tehachapi. And this was with a, a blue light beam. So prior to that, I, prior to that, this friend that used to, that actually crawled in the air vent and saw the aliens, um, he had a two-story house and um, he was dating my girlfriend. So I'd go over there and spend the night and one, and he used to see like an owl in his window every night, an owl. And he would feel um, them talking to him and they would touch him. They would like go like this on his skin. And, and um, he, he pretty much felt that he was being abducted a lot. So the one night I spent the night there, you know, I can't remember what happened. I woke up and I'd actually had like a little scoop of skin off of my knee or leg area. And I'm like, no way, no way. You know, I thought something very weird had happened. So, um, this, and then, so when I went home, I lived in this little cabin at the top of a hill 
and I live by myself and I would do meditation and things like that. That's when I got a major, major visitation. So one night <clears throat> I was kind of laying there half in, half out, you know, that state that you have to get into to be relaxed enough to where um, you're more open to, to sensing things and feeling things. And I heard people talking outside and I thought, wow, I don't have neighbors. Who's outside my house, you know? Next thing you know, um, I hear someone walking through my kitchen, walking around the living room and walking to my bedroom. And I was so scared that, you know, I turned over and I just kind of hid. And I knew someone was standing there. You know, when you can sense that, you can almost feel their presence. I finally turned around and looked and it was a blue light being it was like i i don't know if it was a man or woman it was kind of androidish it you know didn't have any hair it, it was just a um it was actually kind of see-through but the light the the i guess the the skin around it or whatever it had like these um um veins but they were like like um, electrical uh circuits or whatever and it just had all the colors of the universe. It was so beautiful. And it was just kind of glowing and things like that. And I'm like, holy hell. And it had a little box, like a little square box in its hand. And it handed it out to me. And I'm like, oh, no. Hell no. I'm not taking nothing from you. And I turned over. And, and as I turned over and hid, it set the box down on the bed behind me. And I just laid there until it went away, you know, I was scared to death. And finally I woke up and, um, well, you know, I had fallen asleep after that. And then I had woken up. Obviously there was nothing there. You know, you never really know what to believe when you see these things. But shortly after that, and now I was living in Bear Valley and it was directly on top of what Ant Hill, if you know, in the Tejon area, the Ant Hill area, all those tunnels under there. I used to do meditating and I actually think that I set off an earthquake. There was an earthquake right there. It was the epicenter of right where I was meditating, you know. So that's when I kind of realized, well, something's happening to me, right? So I used to wake up and my body would literally be vibrating so hard that I would be like, what's wrong with me? You know, vibrating, vibrating, vibrating. And I thought, something's going on, you know, some, something's messing with me. And then I had a, um, a dream or something of where I was actually on a table um, and there I was being worked on. And they just said, we're almost done, we're almost done. And I thought, wow, am I being abducted? Why is this happening? And then one day, something jolted me awake so hard. It was like the room lit up. It was like turning on a circuit breaker and having the most brightest lights in the room that you can imagine just light up my room and me being jolted awake. And I thought, what is going on? You know, I was just having these experiences after experiences. And um, that's when I kind of started looking into, into aliens and things. And um, of course, you never really believe it. You know, you just don't know what's happening to you. Um, I believe that I had some more visitations there, uh, but that's when I started hearing kind of like, a, I guess, guardian angel, a woman and a man or somebody was talking to me a lot. It was like I literally got switched on to where my abilities just were crazy, okay? Um, that's when I could start meditating to where I could start bilocating. So, when I realized that the people that I was meditating and praying for and thinking about, they would start seeing like a apparition or, you know, like a white, I don't know, like a white lady, I don't know, just like a white apparition. And they would say, were you thinking about me or meditating around this time? And I say, yeah, I was. And they're like, I swear to God, I seen something. You know, my girlfriend would see me like standing next to her bed at night, like a light body. I'm like, how is this happening? I'm not, you know, I'm really not aware of this. 
So one time I told my daughter, because my daughter lived in Las Vegas, I said, I'm going to do something. I want you to be home um, at a certain day and a certain time. And I'm going to meditate. And I'm going to try to come visit you. And you tell me what you see. So I did my thing. And I, I meditated for a good half hour. But I didn't hear from her. So a couple days later, she calls me. She goes, oh, mom, I forgot. She's like, I don't know who you think you are, but you freaking showed up at my house like an angel. You came through the ceiling, which is what I did, and you kind of just dropped into my room and you kind of just put your arms next to you and you kind of just stood up and you were just looking at me. You were just like, you know, like this. I, I knew it was you. You were transparent, but, but I could see you there. And I thought, wow, okay. This really is happening, you know? And I realized that I just had these crazy, insane abilities. And I started becoming telepathic. And um, I could see what people were doing. I could tune into people and things like that. Um, and then I decided to move to Vegas because, I, you know, I just wanted to be with my daughters and things. And that's where things really got crazy. <laughs> they really tuned it up um so i got a house with my boyfriend and um um that's when i started hearing things like um you have to listen to horus and i'm like horus who i don't i didn't know who horus was and then they would say like you have to restore him you have to restore horus and I have no knowledge of the Egyptians, mind you. No knowledge at all. But so I started kind of um, listening to some of these podcasts and things, and that's where I came across you. And that's when we started talking. I would tell you about my experiences and things like that. So, I mean, that was uh, five, six years ago. Um, and then I started seeing um, stargates and portals. Um, and that's when that reptilian, I saw a reptilian in my room, which I had no idea what a reptilian was. It had spikes, like spikes coming out of its back from the, from its head down the back. And they, and they were kind of flimsy. And um, the face kind of looked like a, a, a kind of smashed nose. Um, and then he kind of had like an armor a little bit of armor on and um it came walking through my room and turned and went into my into my bathroom and you know i'm like what did i just see so um i just went into meditation because i was laying in my bed i went into meditation and i had my angels come down and take this thing away or i imagined it in meditation um after that, I would uh, be walking up my stairs and I could actually see through my wall that there was some kind of a, um, a gremlin or something sitting on my bed, you know, like with a weird nose and the warts and hunched over and it was sitting on my pillow and, and I could see it. So I started to, develop, you know, I realized I could start seeing things um, through walls. And so I went to lay down. I thought, oh, God, is there something on my pillow? Well, my dog jumped up on the bed and he was looking at something on the pillow. And I, so I'm looking and the dog was like just mesmerized at my pillow. So, you know, I'm like, okay, there, there must be something there for your dog to see it. Um, anyways, so experiences like that started happening. And, and then I started having uh, experiences of vampire type, type beings. Uh, coming into my house. So I started developing some kind of a third eye where I could literally see into the astral and around me. And I saw coming up my stairs like this vampire looking creature with this grin on its face coming up. And I thought, wow, um, what is going on here? What is this, you know? Um, and then I felt like I was always having to fight things off astrally. Um, 
So I started following like the super soldier movement and started following, listening to, to people that were having experiences with abductions and things like that. And I actually had, and I'm not going to mention names, but I had one of the females in the movement um, come into me in the astral and I had to fight her off. Um, I mean, it led up to, there was some events where I saw some, some things that happened in real life, which I didn't know about it till later. I actually saw what really happened and I was walking through the streets trying to look for these people. And I went into a corner, like an alley, and this gal came at me and she plunged this um, sharp object in my shoulder. And I had to pull it out and I had to come after her and I literally plunged it back. I'm not gonna tell you where, but I plunged it back and I, I had no idea who, why, where, why this was happening, but I eventually found out who it was and things like that. And I just felt like, um, I felt like once I started participating in some of these conversations online and saying a little bit about who I was and what I did, that it was just like flies on poop, to the attacks that I was getting. Um, and I know that I, you know, I had some conversations with you along the way. One of the things that I wanted to mention was before I had moved to Las Vegas, I, um, I, my mom had moved to Tehachapi and I went to go live with her and I had some weird experiences happen there. I had just, uh, broke up with my boyfriend. I actually was engaged to him and we broke up. So it was pretty hard. And I remember just crying a lot. Um, and then one night, some balls of blue light, or I'm sorry, balls of green light came through the wall and were spinning around, floating around in my room. And then shortly after that, I had, um, I had some star beings or some angels or something. I didn't know if they were angels or what, but they, they look like huge life-size stars. There was at least three of them in my room and one of them was laying next to me and, and I had been crying and she started singing Amazing Grace to me and she told me telepathically, we love you so much. Um, and then they, they gave me some very great words of advice and they said, how are you ever supposed to know who you're supposed to be if you don't trust your decisions? Because I had broken up with this man and I thought I was second guessing myself. You know, and I was trying to get him back in the whole bit. And they just said, you know, trust your trust your decisions so that you can move on and with your life. Of course I didn't, but um and then they gave me some wings. Uh, I had some some white wings float down and attached to my shoulders like claws just attach in there and then the wings laid down and rested next to me. And they said, you know, you're supposed to be doing something important. So, so, and, and they told me all this telepathically. And then um, the next day I told my mom about it and there was actually some red, some green, I'm sorry, I keep seeing all these different colors. There was also some green residue on the outside of the wall where where that energy came through and, and it was there for my mom to see. I mean, it looked like some kind of a green residue. And so I don't know if that was balls of lights that eventually turned into those, those white bright beans, but, um, that was, so that was, um, into Hatchapi and then moving forward when I, when I moved to Vegas, um, and then, um, I started, smelling roses and, and there wouldn't be anything there. I, I started having visions of like a goddess fly into my face. Um, I started having symbols come at me and things like that. Um, you know, I just, I just, all these things were happening to me and I, I just, I would tell people and they would just look at me like, you know, it's like crazy. Again, I just had to keep it to myself. And 
um, and the boyfriend that I was living with, like um, sometimes I would lay on his side, his side of the bed and I would get up and I'd say, all right, I know what you're doing. You know, I'd have visions of, of different women and things. Um, I just developed this um, where I could pick up the residual energy of people and see what they were doing. And, and I mean, the, the gifts or the powers or whatever you want to say were just growing and growing and growing to the point where, um, you know, it got a little scary. Um, so when I started seeing the reptilians and the, and the, and the other vampires and things, um, you know, I could see them in the astral, in the astral realm with my third eye. Um, these vampires apparently were, were pretty numerous in my room, um, which I believe that um, it all, those came also from listening to the super soldiers and some of the people that were uh, talking about vampires. I thought that they were um, like the bat creatures that they, one of the super soldiers was talking about. Um, I felt like, you know, they were, they were just all around me as well. There was one incidence where I was laying on my back in bed. And like I told you on, on our interview, it was like this, this black shadow thing swooped over me and laid on me and stuck something in my third eye. You know, if it was like a needle or something that got stuck in my third eye. And, and then I was able to see that I have three little disc things in there or whatever they're called. Um, you know, I still don't know what to think of all that, except that I still have that lump there where, where that, where they stuck that thing in there. Um, but more, more about the vampires. Um, they are, uh, really prominent in this area. And there's a whole swarm of really dark ones that are in the Pahrump area. Pahrump is what, 45 minutes to an hour, and it's going closer to Area 51. Uh, apparently, there's there's just a whole, and it's the bad ones, the really bad ones. You know, I had an interview with Duncan Ophinian, and he had said he spent some time in that area, and there was just bunches of them, and the really bad ones. Um, so, so moving on i got tired of, of of being attacked and and i just wanted to not have any associations with that whole super soldier group and um i met a friend and uh he said hey we're doing paranormal investigations you know we're gonna go ghost hunting do you want to go and so i said yeah um and so that's when i just turned my whole focus on to a whole nother um paranormal um, area group. And so I started, I met up with this team and we started going to these locations and I started filming and um, they would play these voice boxes. I don't know if you know, if you've heard of them, they're voice boxes. You could hear uh, EVPs and you could communicate with the spirits. Well, every time they had one of those going and I'd walk in the room, I would hear my name out, out of the boxes, Kim, 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 like trying to get my attention, you know, and people would look at me all the time. and like, I'm like, I don't know. Um, and then, so I started filming and when I would go over the film at home, I could get the EVPs and a lot of times I could hear them talking to me. And so some of the things that I could hear in my head were actually coming over onto the videos and things. And so I really started um, delving into to the paranormal and trying to, try to make these videos and things like that because I was able to walk into a, a, a building and I would get the chills and then I, I could hear those disembodied voices. And it was quite a trip. I mean, if, if anyone hasn't done that before, it's a whole nother world and uh, there's all kinds of things going on. Um, we would we would always go to um, like different places, and I remember going into this one um, barber shop in Kingman, Arizona, it was supposedly really really haunted, and um, I listened to the evidence when I got home, and there was actually a woman. And she would be screaming at these entities, like, leave them alone. And 
she would actually be going after them. And um, another time um, in the Goldfield High School, which I'm doing a documentary right now, uh, I picked up that I was asking who's here because I would see like wisps and I would hear a woman's voice and I was sensing things. And I said, who's here? And um, I got really strong as ever a voice saying Hawthorne. Now I haven't talked, told you about Hawthorne. Hawthorne, she, well, I went to do Reiki training in Las Vegas as soon as I got here. And I was getting an attunement and one of the, and the Reiki master, one of the things that she asked us to do was to um, ask who our guardian angel was. And so I was there with my eyes closed and I'm asking really hard, who are you? What's your name? Who's my guardian angel? And the first thing that I saw was one of those bulls, you know, like in the um, Spain, in the caves in Spain, the really old drawings of the bull. I got that flash in front of me and then I heard Hawthorne and I was seeing colors of red and things like that. Well, after the attunement, the group sat down and we, were, we went around the circle like, okay, what'd you get? What'd you get? What'd you get? And people were like, oh, I got my grandmother. I got my mom, whatever. You know, when she got to me, she said, stop. I have to tell you what I saw. And so she said that standing behind me, she saw a very, very, very ancient, almost iconic very beautiful woman standing there and she was just like she was so amazed that she couldn't even like speak and i said okay does she look like this and i described her and she said yes and i said wow i said i've seen her and she's talking to me and she gave me the name of hawthor and i, I had no idea like this is the around the time where i was hearing uh talk to Horace, um, listen to Horace, restore him. It was right around that time or before. I had no idea. And she just said that, you know, this is a very old, ancient, iconic goddess type woman and she's with you. And, and, and I go, where, where is she? And you know, she's like, she's just right there, just like right there on you. And I said, okay. Um, you know, and so I started looking into Hawthorne and stuff like that, and I realized who Horace was and things like that. And um, as time went on, I started getting um, this male figure was communicating with me, and he'd show up in my room, and he would start talking to me. He's very tall. He wore a white robe. And he came to me one time, and he showed me some... So those shadow figures, those, those shadow men, there was two or three of them and they had those wide brimmed hats and they were standing there and they, and he told me, they want to take you to an outpost. Do you want to go? And I said, hell no, I don't want to go to no outpost. And these reptilians or whatever, they shadow people, I have no idea, they, they, they were like, you know, she told us no. And I'm like, that's when I started feeling my power and my like abilities. And I'm like, no, you're not taking me to anywhere. And so the, the man that was talking uh, in like um, the mediator said, okay, if you don't want to go to an outpost, then I have to let you know there's going to be a war here on earth. He said, you and your family will be protected, but, um, you know, if you want to stay here, you, you're in danger. So they, and then he told me, he gave me a choice of what I wanted to do. And I said, I want to do earth magic. You know, I want to be able to use my abilities, my magic in a way that's going to help the earth. So he said, okay, you, you need to stay in touch with me and listen for my next message. And every once in a while, I would get almost like a download or something like, do this, do that, do this, do that. And um, I would get these coordinates. I mean, it was just nuts. Um, and then finally, um, I was so happy because 
I, I knew that part of my mission was now to help create a new earth. And um, knowing that, I just started meditating and meditating and meditating and just getting more and more information. Um, <clears throat> I had a lot of memories from my past life starting to bleed through at that time, too. So I was getting really confused. And I tried to figure out, you know, where, what bloodline or something, where, where, what is making me to where I, I'm here now in this time. So I started, I had this memory. And I remember just walking one day straight out and having this come to my head. So it wasn't like I was asleep and it wasn't a dream. It was a memory that fit, you know, just came to my head. And I remember being in, in what I want to say, like a garden area. And there was rocks. And I was standing next to someone. It almost looked like a Chinese, you know, had like Chinese, some kind of uh, bushes and things. Um, mountains off in the distance. It was just this gardens. And I was studying or talking to someone next to this huge rock. And oh, here comes this, this man. And I want to say he was like a sergeant or some, something. Came to me and said, we need you. And I said, what do you mean you need me? He goes, we need you to go on another mission. And, and I was my jaw dropped because I said, what do you mean? I just got back from a mission. I thought I was done with, with going out. And they said, we know, we know, we told you, but we need the best. And I, and I looked and I remember talking with someone right there and I said, well, what's going on? And so he brought me over and there was, there was a couple of other people and he showed me a hologram and it was like round. And um, I was able to look down into it and I, I was able to see what was going on here. And they were showing me what they wanted me to do and I needed to come down here and they had this big old elaborate plan for, for uh, apparently they were calling all people, you know, and, and because I had experience and things like that, uh, that they felt like hopeful for me to come down here. And I said, no, your plan is not going to work. That's the worst plan I've ever heard in my life. I'm not doing it, <laughs> you know, there's no way. And a part of me was really sad and hurt because I thought I had already earned my stripes and done with all this stuff. And I, they made me feel so bad. I guess we had people in here already that needed to be rescued or whatever. And I felt bad for those people. And so I said, okay, the only way I'm going to go back down in there is if we can do it my way. And, they, and, then, and then I was pulled aside and they were working with me on a plan. And they said, well, what do you think is going to work? And I said, this is what I think is going to work. And it's the only way I'll go down in there. And I said, okay, we're going to let you have your plan. And, and I said, okay. So they, so the next thing you know, they're showing me a computer and now these other, this other part with the computer and, and the part I'm going to tell you now, those had happened in uh, subsequent memories. So then I remember being into to like a computer room and they were showing me uh, almost like an iPad. You know how you, you, you can swipe now? They were showing me different women, different um, avatars or whatever you want to say. And they were showing me, who do you want to be? Who do you want to be? And they kept flipping. I'm like, no, 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 no. None of those. Oh my God. What do you, what do you think? And then finally there was me. And it was me when I was probably around 18. And it was, um, when I was at a football game and I remember just standing there so as you can see the lights of the football stadium. And I said, yeah, her, her, her. I want to be her. And they're like, are you sure? And I'm like, yes. Yeah. So they kept swiping and kept swiping. I'm like, no, no, no. And I'm like, her. Like, okay, it's done. And they started, you know, whatever they do, typing in coordinates and like picking me. 
and they said, okay. Um, and then, I don't know, they prepared me for the plan or whatever, and they went off and made their plan and things like that. And then when I was supposed to be activated, they called me into this like landing area and they said, are you ready for your mission? And I said, yeah. And I was all excited because um, they had they had asked me to come down here and be a, the queen, okay? And I had said, um, no, I don't want all that responsibility. I don't want to be in that much limelight. I don't want to be in all that, that, um, that, I don't know, I guess I had been a queen in other lifetimes or something to where I didn't want to be, I just want to be a normal person. I said, the only way it's going to work is if you just let me be a normal person and then I'll have my mission. And it was almost like I was, um, bye, <laughs> my daughter. It was almost like I was going to be a double agent uh, because they wanted me to still do parts of what they wanted me to do but I still want to do what I want to do. So I said, if you just make me an average person, I can possibly do both. So at the end, they're like, okay. And then I, and they're like, are you sure you don't want to be the queen? And I said, well, maybe I do want to be the queen. Well, maybe I do want to be special. Maybe I do want to do something like that. And they're all, oh, okay, what do you want to do? And I said, blah, 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 blah. And they're like, okay, we'll add that into your script. And then, when I got to the landing zone, they said, okay, here's your mission. We're not making you a queen. <laughs> They're like, we're going back to the original plan that we wanted. And basically everything that I had agreed to, to come down here was scrapped. And so I was so upset. And at that moment I thought, we'll see, we'll see what's going to happen. And I remember them floating me out into the darkness and then showing me a pin of light and they're saying that point of light right there that's where you need to go and so at that time and that person was still floating with me telling me you know we're, we're gonna miss you and i was gonna be a gone a long time the whole bit do good and all this stuff and next thing you know i'm going through the a beam of light boom and then how I got, and then after that, I don't know. And so when these memories started coming at me, I mean, I was still into Hatchapi. I'm like, what in the hell? So it's, so it's like, what happened to me from my childhood to the point um, about 20 years ago to where I don't remember any of this. It, in fact, I don't even remember a lot of the, the childhood, you know, but all of a sudden here now I'm remembering all this stuff. And so that's when I, I literally started meditating in order to, to get more information. Um, and then so, so moving on in Las Vegas, the, I don't know, the orders or the mission or whatever started weighing heavy on me. Like I know I'm supposed to be doing something. And so I used to like say, what's going on here? I would yell and I would yell. And then I would get these, I would get these uh, messages that said, we don't have to tell you anything. You know, we don't have to tell you anything. And I said, wow, I got duped. You know, I feel like I got duped. And so um, um, here I am now. And things are starting to open up for me more and more. I'm getting uh, more, more and more powers. Uh, I'm getting more and more abilities and things like that. And it's all for a reason, I know. Um, do you have any questions before I go? Oh, just so many things <clears throat> to ponder. The, the Hathor aspect, Hathor, uh, and I'll go by your pr pronunciation. Th that is interesting because it, it 
suggests some connection with the uh, ancient Egyptian pantheon of gods and goddesses. Uh, you and I had discussions about that in the past that were regarding Horus and regarding uh, Hathor. I believe there's something to that because some of us have likewise, well, yourself included, of course, have these past life connections with ancient, ancient Egypt, not just what the Egyptologists talk about. I mean, like 30, 40, 50,000 years ago. Uh, and some of us have had multiple lives in Egypt too. So I'm not going to elaborate on it, but in a recent communication to me, you reminded me of something that, that we had talked about in the past uh, about uh, our ancient lineages, if you will, and, and the fact that in, in some of these lineages and past life incarnations, we were deeply involved in this cosmic espionage game that some of the the gods and goddesses that people know of today that at some level we used to interact with them work against them spy on them <laughs> and do all this other kind of stuff right so all that is embedded in our genetic memory and our dna profile and i'm also reminded of uh, of some of the stuff that we I, again, I can't, and I don't want to upset or offend our listeners, but <clears throat> so much of the work that you and I have done and, and others, uh, you know, it, it needs to remain classified uh, because, you know, it's sensitive, it's important. It, it delved into a lot of different issues. But when Kim is talking about this kind of cosmic lineage and coming here on a mission, that really resonates with me because some of us have at least partial memories of being in, in higher dimensional planes and in, in in other realms and other worlds. And I've heard from others similar stories where they said, you know, they were called to a mission to come to earth, right? And, you know, this call had gone out to get volunteers essentially to come here to willingly go through the process of the rebirth cycle and the reincarnation cycle and the mind swipe cycle. And that's, that's a big ask to, to ask a higher dimensional being to go into a world of so much darkness and so much chaos and confusion and, and rage and warfare with the understanding at some level. And in, in your case, <laughs> I hate to say it, but it sounds almost like you were, in a way, double-crossed, right? like they've done with so many, even at a surface level, setting off operatives and, and espionage agents, and they're told one thing, but when they get on the ground, the, the reality is entirely different, right? Uh, they don't really, even really know who they're working for sometimes, and, and that's the case in, in the cosmic uh, wars and the cosmic espionage spy game. So... A, a lot of what you've said, well, virtually everything you've said resonates with me. And you talked about the anthill. And what was the name of that other underground facility where uh, that friend of yours had crawled into an air duct? Well, that was in Sand Canyon. Uh, where Sand exactly? Canyon. I've never heard of that base. Where is that? So is it's, that? it's actually in between Ridge Crest and Tehachapi. Okay. Now, for, you know, if you're yes, I, I know Ridge Crest. Uh, for for those who don't know, Ridgecrest is not too far from China Lake. Am I am I right? Uh, that's it's a it's a notorious area as far as uh, reptilians are concerned, as far as underground bases are concerned, as far as my lab activity is concerned. Uh, just the energy there. I remember one time, me and a friend were uh, we were going out to see Bill and Pam Hamilton actually, and the moment we turned on to Highway 14, uh, you know that that highway that takes you in the direction of Lancaster and uh, in Palmdale, the energy just radically changed. We both felt it instantly because that whole area of China Lake Ridgecrest is, it's a very, in, in my view, it's a very dark place. And so it, it's not surprising that uh, Sand Canyon or whatever it's called would be an underground base there. And also you talked about the Ant Hill. And, and for those who don't know, uh, the Ant Hill is, it's over there at or near the Tehan Ranch, am I, am I correct? Uh, mm -hmm, in, yeah. In the, the Tehachapi Mountains, it's a large underground facility within a mountain, uh, a 
mountain range and Northrop is one of the corporations that developed a large underground facility there and there are the reports I've heard and a, a lot of the information that Bill Hamilton had, uh, the sources he developed back in the day that Northrop uh, the Northrop facility uh, beneath the anthill is, is a joint US military aerospace alien facility and there are a number of eyewitnesses some people have been taken inside abducted where they saw aliens and, and humans working together and eyewitnesses have seen a, a large number at times of craft various types saucers large boomerang shaped craft <clears throat> etc going to land and depart from this place so it, 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 at least in the old days I don't know about now but it was an active, lack of a better term, spaceport kind of place. So, and also Pam Hamilton, oh, she was abducted, taken on board a craft, and then she was looking out of a porthole, and then she noticed that she was flying towards the, the Tejan Ranch, Ant Hill area, and she saw as the craft was descending, looking out this porthole, she saw a part of the mountainside shift over like a hatch being slid over and then she looked down and she saw like a landing pad like a like a big black landing pad with, with the number 41 on it if memory serves and then the craft descended through this hatch into the underground facility landed the hatch above closed and uh, the covering of the hatch had vegetation dirt camouflage to make it blend in perfectly with the uh, with the terrain. Bob Lazar talks about a similar thing with the uh, the facility at S4 that he worked at, the, where the, the, the sides of the mountain there at uh, S4 were like just perfectly blended in with the rest of the mountainside. And after that experience, Pam had gotten a friend who, who had who was a private pilot had his own light plane and they went flying around the mountain looking for that place of course they didn't find it because of the camouflage and all that but she had very clear memories of being taken inside there so it's interesting that with your background you find yourself in places like Tehachapi, <laughs> Ridgecrest and then Vegas. Vegas is a whole nother story and, yeah. and I like your thoughts on this because um, I, I knew a lot of the old timers uh, in Vegas back in the late 80s, early 90s. And they talked about this one mountain that would open up at a certain time of the day. And then suddenly they were sensitive enough to feel it, but it probably affected everyone in, in Las Vegas to some degree. But they noticed that when the top of the mountain opened up and they could see with binoculars and whatnot, uh, like antenna arrays and, and, and what have you, that they would begin to feel the effects of the energy waves being generated by these antenna on top of this mountain. And again, the mountain opened up. And, and when I would be hanging around them, they would say amongst themselves, uh, is, is the mountain open today? And I didn't know what they were talking about. And what they meant was, it, later on they briefed me on it, was this mountain... When the mountain top is closed, nothing goes on. But when they look over sometimes and suddenly there's an installation up there, that's when they, well, that's what they mean when they say that the mountain is open, right? And wow. then they, they, they notice that they would begin to feel these electromagnetic frequencies. They'd be, they'd be, it would start to put them off, right? And make them feel funny, yeah. right? And, and to the point where if memory serves, um, news of this got around so much that I think that even local media uh, became interested, probably in an effort to debunk it. But the thing about Las Vegas is you have Nellis nearby, you have Area 51, uh, you know, as a crow flies, not too far away. I've been there a number of times. I'm not Area 51, but been to Rachel, Nevada. So there's a, there's a large reptilian presence there, right? Uh, because the my labs and abductees I knew there, so many of them had reptilian experiences. So many of them had military experiences. And you felt that that vampire element that was there was um, 
it seemed to be pretty strong there. And did you get the feeling these were uh, interdimensional beings or th were they physical somewhere and they projected themselves astrally? Or like you had the ability to project yourself astrally? Or um, it seems to me like they were a distinct species unto themselves. So wh what do you think about that? <clears throat> well, I've done some research on them and um, initially they were interdimensional or astral. <clears throat> and um, and then after I started doing ghost hunting, I actually met some um, physical real ones. In fact, there was two vampires on the team that I initially started with. <clears throat> and then that's when it really hit the fan. Okay. So, so you, you, I mean, and there's a lot of vampires here that I'm, that I'm finding out and, um, and there's, and, and like there is, there's different ones. Okay. So there's, there's like an astral one that, um, uh, will, will meditate and will go and, um, astral project and they'll stay attached by their, um, their cord, that silver cord. And they'll go out and they'll literally suck, suck people's life force. And it, what happens is it, it, um, now somebody's blood actually, um, has a, uh, the life force that's in the blood, the blood actually kind of, now this is hard to explain. I have it in notes, but, um, let me just try to refresh my memory. It kind of, like evaporates or changes to where it's uh, a portion of it is is around is um, in the in your life force. So your blood actually transposes or overlaps into your life force. So your blood is not just red and liquid and solid. Your blood is also like um, like a vapor or or it can. Um, change form and it's also in your life force so um so now they can feed on that and they're literally feeding uh so there's that type and, th and then there's another type that are human and and actually drink blood um they get some kind of um life force off off of that and there's um the two vampires that were on the team with me. Now, one of them was a psychic vampire or an energy vampire, and one of them was a real vampire. And I will be, if, if you're interested in, I, I have been putting together um, a documentary about that whole experience. Um, it's just been hard doing because uh, of the nature of it uh, and trying to expose people at, at a, you know, trying to expose people that, I'm, I know I'm going to get attacked after it, but so the energy vampire, she was a female and she claims to be Mary Magdalene. And when I actually told her about the Hawthorne thing, she came after me. Um, she, I would see um, her coming at me in my, you know, astrally uh, telling me she's going to bleed me. I would see drops of blood floating up, you know, and mind you, my third eye, I, I am wide awake. If anything comes at me astrally, and if I'm asleep, and that's when they come at you, your third eye wakes up. And it, and then you could see the blood leaving. Um, I would hear banshees, like crying, like, you know, that, that um, wailing sound. I would start hearing that. I started um, seeing like an old hag with long hair uh, and dark, dark circles, just looking like a, an old hag thing. Um, the, um, the things that were coming at me were just too much for me to handle. So I had, I had to get hold of my shaman and I had to ask for protection from that. Now I did confront that lady and I said, look, I know what you've been doing. I've seen you do this. And she got so nervous and she said, well, I didn't say it was going to bleed you. I, I actually said I would bleed for you. So I actually caught her and she actually admitted. Now I also got from, um, 
because I would go into meditation because I was making a documentary where we went into the Goldfield High School and some really bad things happened there. People got attacked. She was actually out in the motorhome meditating. And, and I, through meditation, I could see that she was actually going in with her astral body and attacking kids that were in there. Um, so I could, um, I could hear the reasons why she was doing it. She, she basically told me that she can't get energy, that she has a disease where she can't get energy on her own. She has to feed off people. Now, what had happened in that experience was there was kids in there that were on the tour with us. The other vampire on the team who literally said that he is part, uh, he has seven parts, um, three parts of Dracula are, are in his soul or whatever, and that he has to feed. And he literally does drink blood. And he literally does have a donor. And anytime he wants to do like blood magic or a spell or a curse, he'll go and he will have sex with this person and drink their blood. And then that powers them up to where they can do these, whatever they do. Okay, so I documented, I, I was fascinated. I, I started recording uh, and filming um, all of these experiences and these people's stories. And again, that's all gonna be in my documentary, but it, it's very sensitive, uh, you know? Um, yeah, take all necessary precautions. I mean, to just like what Well, no, people these people you. know, and, and they basically agreed, but, but how it affected me I didn't always come forward, but it affected me really bad. Um, you know, I would I would be sleeping and my third eye would wake up and the one vampire would be in bed with me, like laying there. And then, um, so basically what was happening was those two vampires were fighting with each other at that Goldfield um, High School trip where there was kids in there. They were fighting over those kids' kids' energy, one was trying to protect. I mean, it was a big mess, okay, big mess. And and then because I was trying to expose it, they came after me. I literally was being drained. I had, like I said, I had to get my shaman to help me with that. My shaman said, yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot of vampires, not just those, there's a lot of vampires. And because of my light was so bright, um, and, you know, that's the backside of, of being enlightened is you get fed off of if you're not careful, you know. And so come to find out now um, what you would the, the person that allows to be fed off of and drink are not some of them aren't necessary vampires they are called black swans. And I don't know if anyone's heard that term, but there's a term called black swan and they're they do favors for these vampires and, and on return, they, you know, they give their blood up. And so I, I'm able to uh, see astrally some of the other vampires that are actually in the community, the awake and aware communities that are posing as light workers. So again, you have to be really careful. Um, there's a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. Well, we reached the end of a fascinating and thought provoking first segment with Kim Russell. Uh, Kim, could you uh, give us your website address and your, your contact information if people want to share their stories and, or, or get in comms with you? Well, I do have a website. It's brand new and, and you had mentioned it earlier. Um, I think it was VIP Paran or VIP Inc. Paranormal. Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, you can get a hold of me on Facebook. Uh, Kim Russell, or I have uh, Haunted Reality TV on Facebook, or my YouTube is Haunted Reality TV. Um, and the next portion, I'm going to go ahead and go into some of my past lives and things like that. So it should be good. Should be good. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. And then to our um everyone watching this, if you like what we do, if you believe what we do, please go to the cosmic switchboard.com, sign up and become a member, and we'll see you at the top of the next segment.